Um, so, hi, Kathy. Um, you know, with the new report coming out, I think it's uh, quite interesting to to hear what the findings are. But can you give us a little bit of background on what are the CRCs and what needs do they serve in our communities? Well, the California Caregiver Resource Centers are a system of 11 centers that serve every part of the state of California, every community and county in the state of California with services and supports for family caregivers, unpaid family caregivers who are caring for uh, someone with an adult onset cognitive impairment. And largely um, the uh, CRCs care for those that have some form of dementia, whether it's Alzheimer's or Lewy body or vascular dementia. Um, we also work with Parkinson's, stroke, head injury, um, a variety of different disabilities that cause um, a cognitive uh, impairment, typically with a cognitive decline over time. So the services and supports are really tailored to the individual need of a family who contacts us. So at the time that they contact us, families will need different thing, different kinds of services over time. So we really work with what that family needs for the time that they uh, are contacting a CRC. And also talk a little bit about maybe some of their future needs to make sure that they're considering choices and um, decisions that they might you know, have to make at this time uh, for future um, developments. So the services and supports um, are, are pretty broad. Um, first, we do uh, a common assessment. We really talk to families about what it is that they're needing and what they need uh, to maintain their own health, what the person that they're caring for, what they need for their own direct care needs or behavioral needs, and then what are the planning needs for the family. So it's sort of in three, three buckets that we um, consider. And we come up with, um, you know, some considerations of and information that's tailored to their situation and needs at the time of contact. So we have a wide variety of services, lots of informational materials in various formats in video and audio formats, as well as written formats. We have um, classes, uh, educational programs. We have interventions that really address some of the um, emotional needs of families, uh, caregivers, the kind of stress that a family might uh, uh, be feeling as well as uh, depression and, and social isolation. And then we um, uh, provide interventions. We have a brokered respite program, a, a consumer directed respite program where families can choose what types of respite works best for them. Um, and uh, legal and financial planning advice um, to kind of guide them in the decisions that they need to make along the way for uh, being able to provide care for the individual needing assistance, as well as the health of the family itself um, on a legal and financial basis. So we tie all of those things up um, and provide that information and work with families to address the issues that they need to address at that moment. So while we address um, the immediate needs of a family at the time that they contact us, we also are. Um, we also work with families over the course of um, their caregiving journey. So what we do is leave the door open always for families to return uh, to us when their care situation change, when maybe their own health needs change when um, they need to uh, make adjustments in what they're doing uh, within their, their care situation. So we work with families on a longitudinal basis. We're really in it for the long haul. We see families over the course of many, many years. Um, we involve them in our regular communications um, with newsletters and notices of programs that might be of interest to families. So we keep in touch in a variety of ways. And what we find is 
that you know more than half of the contacts that we have each year come from what I would call returning clients, returning families who contact us when their care needs change or when their own health needs dictate that they need to make a change. So we're, we're in it for the long haul. Uh, and then the process starts again and we assess where, where they are and then move on from that point forward. Kathy, with the release of the new report from UC Davis, what do you, um, what's your perspective on the key findings that are in the report? So the report um, is, is really gives us a window into the daily experience of family caregivers at this particular moment. And I say this particular moment because we have been doing these types of reports for many decades. So we can, we can reach back and say, how is this different um, today as it was, you know, maybe 10 years ago? And that's a really interesting perspective to have because we've, we've had this kind of data before. And what's striking about this particular report are, is the, the level of distress that we find families in. And this really is part and parcel of, um, the, of COVID. There's an overlay of COVID. Um, which means that we find that um, there's a significant number of families who, who, who are not receiving um, any type of paid support at this point. In fact, 70% um, of families reported that they, they did not uh, pay for any types of services or receive services in that way. And we also find that there's a drop off of uh, friends and family that are uh, assisting with um, a day, you know, help uh, to the unpaid uh, caregiver, to the family caregiver. And that's, that is about 40%. This is, these are ra relatively large numbers, but if you think about the context of COVID um, with services closing or having to modify um, um, practices, uh, so there's, there's less services available. And during this time, there was a reluctance to have a lot of family and friends in their primary home, in the caregiving home. And so this says that, you know, these caregivers have been providing essentially 24-hour care for a long period of time without a break or respite or assistance. Um, and that's caused some higher levels of depression than we've seen in the past and um, loneliness than we've seen in the past. And all of these are, you know, what we would consider um, and strain, what we would consider to be um, values associated with or exacerbated by, um, by COVID. Um, so, so this is a little bit different than, than what we have experienced in the past. And the fact that we had to pivot of course, to deliver most of these services online or by phone, um, that's also served as another um, type or another upset um, in terms of receiving services, but one that families have, you know, pretty readily embraced for the most part. Um, and we see uh, many, many more um, instances uh, of families reaching out to receive counseling services and support groups and other types of programs that really link people together, but give them skills and tools for dealing with uh, strain and depression and social isolation and those types of things. So that's, that's, that's really uh, significant. One of the other points that has been interesting is that we've had a drop off in the employment rate in families. Uh, it, we used to average around 48% of full or part-time employed caregivers in addition to their caregiving responsibilities. And that really dropped to about 37%. So we've seen 11% drop since the last time we tracked this was about 10 years ago. And this goes along again with the whole narrative of COVID that there's this great resignation. And some of it is because of the, the, the types of jobs that people are in, but there's been disproportionately a share of, a disproportionate share of women who have left the workforce. And that has been for caregiving responsibilities, whether it's childcare or elder care, or sometimes in a combination of both. 
and they can't juggle all of it. And so um, we see this drop, but it's a it's very distressing uh, because most of our caregivers are under the age of 65, 67 years old when, when you can uh, attain uh, full retirement benefits, which means that you know in the future, their retirement security, their financial security in the future may be jeopardized by a prolonged absence in the workforce uh, for these families. So that's a little bit concerning as well. One of the other um, report's key findings is something that's um, sli slightly different than the way in which we've characterized um, the amount of direct assistance uh, that families have provided in the past. And that is that we decided to, um, to ask about what other tasks besides the activities of daily living and instrumental activity, uh, activities of daily living, the ADLs and IADLs that's normally in these types of reports to expand it to include the medical tasks that families are undertaking. And this is really important because we have moved a lot of the more complex care and the medical tasks into the home. And this is a, this is a trend um, that's going on nationally. And what we wanted to see is, is that going on in this population? And what we find is that, yes, there is a great deal of what we call medical tasks. That's organizing and providing uh, medication and using meter, meters and monitors and operating durable uh, medical equipment and managing pain and special diet wound care, those, those types of tasks. And in the data um, collectively, uh, when we look at, you know, how we talk about what families are doing in the home, um, this portion of it is relatively new. In other words, it hasn't really been collected as much um, in research, but also how does it affect you know, how we work with families, what kind of information do we offer them, but how do we know the full extent, again, this window into the experience of family caregivers. This is a big component because 95% um, of families are doing one or more of these types of tasks. And this has to be factored into the total stress um, of the family situation, because um, oftentimes, um, you know, these may or may, may have some complexity to them. There may be some hesitancy or, you know, am I doing this right? And if I don't, you know, uh, if I don't catch a symptom, does that mean there's going to be bad effects for my relative? So there's this heightened vigilance and anxiety around um, you know, doing these types of tasks. So we wanted to make sure that we we included this, and I think this is the first large data sample that does so, that really does express the full extent of what families are doing. So I think that's a really important component and finding for this year. Thank you, Kathy. Um, that leads nicely into the next question here, which is, how does the data for this report differ from the data used in other recent studies about family caregiving? We have um, a fair number of surveys that have been uh, conducted both nationally and we looked at in-state in California. And the one of the most referenced studies is the caregiving in the US. And in the state, we have what's called the CHIS data, the, the California Health Information Survey. And it, there is a caregiver module attached to that. And what we wanted to find out was, you know, how, how different is this population that we're seeing, which is, you know, quite distressed? How does this square up or how does this compare to um, the information that's in these other surveys? Now, as a caveat um, to discussing this, first, I wanna say there is nothing wrong with any of the information that's in any of these surveys. Um, they, they asked different, uh, slightly different questions. We tried to match as, as well as possible. Um, and they're slightly different populations and slightly different numbers of 
people that have been uh, caregivers that have been interviewed. But when we talk about this in the larger um, uh, public square, whether it's in a policy mode or whether we're talking, you know, in um, media or even to each other, that we revert to these um, um, these samples, which is which is a good thing because they uh, these surveys um, have validity and they um, they have some uh, they carry some meaning and some weight. But what we found was that we were fairly out of step with the, the mean findings of these, these uh, surveys. And so that um, really speaks to the fact that, you know, where you sample caregivers along their caregiving journey makes a difference. And in the sample that we're talking about in terms of the CRC sample, we are getting um, individuals that are uh, more at the moderate to severe complexity of care stages. And when we talk about uh, these samples, these more public samples, the two that I'm referencing, they are along the spectrum. So their mean is, uh, you know, meets in the middle and they're not seen as many complex care issues as we're seeing or not, it's not expressed in the, in the data. So in some ways um, we have to begin ha changing the conversation. We need to say families experience different things at different times. These are not six month experiences, they're more like six years or more experiences. And throughout this caregiving um, uh, uh, journey, uh, families need different things at different times. And we should always keep that in mind when we hear about, um, you know, there's a higher sample of employed caregivers, um, you know, for example, there, there could be anywhere from 50 to 60, percent of caregivers are in the workforce where we're seeing that there's 37%. And that speaks to the experience of the caregivers at that particular point. When you get to the point where we have the, the, the deeper information about our families at this particular moment, it's a whole different kind of experience. So I know this sounds very convoluted, but it's just to say that we need to change the narrative. We need to say, continue to talk about this as being a changing and evolving kind of caregiving journey, which usually is tilted towards more assistance being provided to the individual than in earlier years. And we need to emphasize that, uh, particularly in policy conversations. Because if you just looked at the mean uh, of this, reverting to the mean in these samples, you would think that caregivers have far less needs than they really have at different points of their experience. So Kathy, um, where do you see this work or this research going from here on out? Because we've collected a fairly robust set of uh, information around families, all de-identified, nobody, nobody's names are used in this database. Um, and it spans such a broad geographic area, albeit it's all in California, um, but it spans, you know, rural and urban and 48% uh, uh, of our sample are non-white. And we're dealing with, you know, a very, um, you know, diff, diff, very difficult care situations. We have only scratched the surface of what we can learn from um, the experiences from families um, in, the, in this particular uh, uh, database. The next step for us is saying, okay, well, what is the deeper dive on this complexity issue? What are families doing? How does it affect um, diverse families? How does this uh, complexity of, of care affect families living in rural areas? So we're asking the questions to try to get at 
you know, what would be the findings from that that can influence um, not only uh, the way in work in which we work with families directly, um, but also are there policy or service recommendations that we can make that would help families um, provide better care uh, in the home uh, and options, you know, for services in the community. So we've only begun to really scratch scratch this uh, the 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 depth of the information. We've only done a surface run of the information, um, and the complexity is definitely one of the next areas because it comes out so loud and clear in the data. But over time, we're going to go back and say. What are the mix of services that have been provided by the CRC that have provided the most benefit or the most improvement or in uh, the, the most help to, to families and understand from a service array what has been most beneficial uh, to families in general, but also what's been beneficial to all of the different types of subpopulations that I just talked about. Um, are there differences and nuances for uh, service uh, impact for families that are in rural areas or urban areas or in diverse communities or LGBTQ communities and so on? You know, what, what works best or what is seen to be um, successful? Uh, across those uh, across those subpopulations, not treating it as California as a whole, but treating it as this very diverse um, uh, population that we have uh, in in the state, and to really drill down and understand, you know, what works and and um, you know what what we may have to change practice on. So the combination of the information, the data that we collect but also in the information from families that they supply to us um, through uh, regular kinds of questionnaires that we um, ask families to give us some other impressions other than just looking at the data. All of these sort of blend together to give you know, a fuller picture of what families are experiencing. And as we drill down, we'll be able to um, talk more about um, in, you know, employment uh, and the impact of employment on caregiving and, um, you know, the impact of doing these medical tasks and, you know, a certain number of medical tasks, all these, all these uh, nuances that we're discovering in the array of questions that we ask can be mine to um, improve the situation for families, either through practice, in our practice, through service recommendations or through policy changes. So we're really um, excited about being able to look more closely at the information that we have. Well, great. Thank you, Kathy, for taking time to chat with us about the, the report that's just come out. And we look forward to seeing what's next with the, this data and the research going forward. Well, I'm glad to be talking with you today about this. And um, we look forward to being able to, to disseminate this information, to use it broadly um, with um, our colleagues in the field, as well as uh, researchers in the field and policymakers and planners at the local and state level to enhance services and supports for family caregivers in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy.